To more deeply comprehend the potential of EdTech, we must examine with a new lens how human beings process conscious experience in order to learn to grasp reality. To that end, scientist and author Donald Hoffman provides novel and pertinent insight into the nature of consciousness through his book, The Case Against Reality, How Evolution Hid the Truth from Our Eyes. His tested and in-depth chronicles into how people see the world opens new doors embarking upon teaching and learning in light of his insight and in how we see the world. Hoffman's central thesis is that not only do we fail to see the eternal reality as a tr of nature as it truly is through the sense of our brain, but rather we barely glean the surface or a morsel of accuracy into reality and in fact nature never intended it to be that way. Instead, our senses provide us with what he analogizes as a user desktop interface which provides symbolic icons that cue us the, of our need to survive in the natural world, mm. i.e. what to eat, what to run from, who to mate with, how to read the intentions of others, etc. For it is this understanding that enables us to perpetuate our genes, and as Darwinian's evolutionary theories postulated a century ago, over a century ago, suggest that uh, reproduction pro uh, proliferation defines the makeup of future generations. What if our senses and consciousness did give us somewhat more accurate, if not limited, view of the world? Hoffman advances and demonstrates with his lab experiments that as beings we would not survive vis-a-vis -vis beings with conscious deciphers of fitness payoffs, things that he symbolizes through clear and perceived eye candy inform us how to act and necessary to get necessary calories. Why would that be? Because according to his research, there is simply far too much information in the world to process and respond in a timely manner. It would be like placing 200 programs on a slow processing computer. It would most certainly crash. Likewise, if our brains had to process a full multitude of data in the surrounding world, we might crash, or just as fatally, our minds would take forever sorting through information. Meanwhile, while frozen in indecision, we'd quickly become a larger creature's lunch. Therefore, to employ the digital metaphor once more, our brain symbolize, compress, error correct, uh, repeat and information so we can move swiftly and wisely. Unpacking Hoffman's provocative analysis further, as a species we live in a strange world of our own creation. We are currently swimming in a sea of technologically driven hypersensory stimuli, few of past generations have had it. Yet as novel as our world seems, the reality of our own captivated senses is nothing new. We have been entranced and bewitched by our sensory stimuli for quite some time. Consider that prior to iPhones and the internet, we had television. Before that, movie theaters and radio. Prior to that, photography, if we go back far enough, we can find that uh, digging even deeper, all the way back to the Renaissance, that Leonardo da Vinci in his innovative genius turned painting into effective 3D photography to the human eye centuries before the camera was invented. Da Vinci achieved his feat through a process that we call perspective and the vanishing point. He devised with a grid design to make all images get smaller toward the center. Some theory is that da Vinci possessed a disability called dyslexia, which prompted him to examine the human eye, compare it the vortex and, uh, and con convex and concave lenses with light and projection screen, and found the eye provides the brain 2D, not 3D image, and the back of the retina, which appears upside down. Our brains, he figured, must reinterpret right side up and with depth, hence the process could easily be reversed, reverse engineered with the right drafting and painting strategies to trick the brain to thinking that a flat plane has depth. Clearly, Hoffman's theory suggests the reason our brains are so suggestible to optical illusions 
and so easily transfixed on visual and other sensory stimuli is because we are ac already naturally accustomed to running interpretive code and puzzle piece type analysis uh, to make sense of our world. With our current technology, many fascinating illusions proliferate. Consider the Ames room effect, where an asymmetric room is crafted, where upon glancing from a particular angle, the mind assumes that the room is symmetrical, since most rooms are, and hence figures moving from side to side are getting actually bigger and smaller rather than closer and further away. Or consider the Ken Burns effect, uh, which began the legendary historic filmmaker documentarian Ken Burns was making his famous American Civil War documentary. Unable to possess film footage, being uh, that he, it didn't exist in the mid-1800s, Burns employed a then novel strategy of taking a still image and having the camera pan and zoom throughout different parts of the photo. The series captivated countless people, but the most interesting finding was that when interviewed, many of the viewers strongly believed they had watched moving footage of this American Civil War. Not possible, but in viewing moving image, a still image coupled, uh, traveling within that image, coupled with captivated narrative, the brain read into the image movement and hence recalled as though actions were witnessed. Why is all this important in view of educational technology? Clearly, these revelations of human consciousness provide hints as to how modality such as video gaming has developed generations of young people into a manufactured alternative universe. Likewise, it should also provide vital insight as to how to revolutionize education through systematized use of technology and the senses. New adaptive learning software must be coded, but first we need to dig deeper into the components of core academic content and how they are perceived by the mind. We know through neuroscience that the left and right hemispheres of the brain, just barely attached to the corpus callosum, possess information quite differently. The left hemisphere tends to handle rules, procedures, sketch work with a lens zoomed tightly inward, while the right hemisphere, by contrast, tends to view living experience embodied in a zoomed out panoramic view, as author and psychologist Ian McGilchrist details in his book, Master and His Emissary. With that in mind, we can delineate core subjects and their respective content and subcomponents and consider how they can be visualized. Take mathematics, for example, Bas basic math, i.e. arithmetic, has traditionally been instructed through computational framework. The focus on procedures and rules, left brain, brain's natural domain. While algebra onward focuses on conceptual and more right brain abstracted approach. The common core has been tempting to shift focus from basic math instruction to a conceptual framework with the knowledge that this method eases the building blocks of advancement with greater emphasis on functional relationships such as the inverse relation of addition subtraction, uh, multiplication division, and compound relation between addition and multiplication, for example. This conceptual approach has been proven through research to help students advance faster through applied knowledge and equations, functions, and shorthand calculations. The trouble is this. Basic math is largely predicated upon structural structures inhabited in base 10 and its necessary laws uh, and procedures uh, such as place, uh, place var values, just as borrowing, carrying, etc. This process tends to entangle the mind left brain procedural thinking, making it difficult to cross over to abstract understanding. Another example of this cross hemispheric confusion can be found in language. Any rudimentary understanding of written or oral speech requires a focus on two distinct disciplinary areas, phonics and semantics. Once again, phonics is largely the domain of the left brain and entails grasping of techn technical constructs of letters, sounds, vowels, and consonants, blended letters, sounds, verbal laws, syllable and sentence structure, etc. Semantics is a wholly distinctive venue of language involving meaning. Moreover, such a phenomenon is not unidimensional. 
rather meaning of words and phrases can take the form of literal, figurative, implied, and contextual, to name a few. This aspect of language, especially in its more opaque and abstract form, is clearly the domain and auspices of the right brain. Yet students must master all these divergent areas to adequately practice language. All this points to sense-applied, sense-blended learning strategies, uh, co uh, some commencing with visualization aided through customized software and delineate for all such areas, sub components and subcomponents. Such content can be assigned color codes, dimensional spatial layout, visual sound scale connections, to name a few. The teacher or instructor utilizing the software can select for a menu of options based on subject, content, student body, interest, along with understanding of form, function, and pattern embedded in core content, along with various quantitative and quality of properties embedded within. Hoffman shows that us that nature provided us a virtual headset to understand the world around us. It is time to develop a virtual reality teaching set that taps into our instinctive, instinctual desires for fitness payoffs to be analogized and applied to learning mastery and payoffs the next generation will need to sustain productive civilization.